going to see how you can analyze load balancing with less than uh, full independence, so less than a fully random hand function. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you implement uh, small independence, <coughs> and then we are going to do a, a few case studies uh, using different degrees of independence, and I'm going to show you how you kind of work with uh, bound independence uh, in, in proofs. So this should take something like 40 or 50 minutes, and after that, the idea is that you use uh, some time to work on exercise in, in groups. So I'm sure you'd like to get some hands-on experience uh, working with these things. So a little bit about prerequisites, of course. Yeah, I should have sent this information to you one week ago, but here, here you go. So, <laughs> but I hope it's not, uh, it's not too bad, actually. So I assume that you have seen hash tables. I assume that you have seen modular arithmetic, so that's multiplication and addition modulo uh, p. Maybe you have also seen finite fields. Uh, if so, that's good. If not, don't worry. Um, and basic randomized analysis, expect expectations, and, and so on. Um, yeah. Many of these things are covered in, in textbooks, of course, and there's also a nice note by my PhD supervisor, actually, uh, who some of these things in case you want to brush up. Anyway, load balancing. So we have some set of items that we want to distribute. So this could be keys in a hash table or it could be something else. We don't know what this set is going to, to be and it's possible that this set is going to, to be dynamically changing and so on. And we want to distribute these items approximately even. This problem pops up in a lot of cases. Also, if you think about uh, solid state drives, different kinds of distributed storage, key value stores, uh, but also computation. If you want to split computations up in many parts, uh, you need to do this, this kind of load balancing. And one of the best ways of doing it is actually just to make these chunks of random. So then uh, you expect that things will distribute kind of uh, nicely. So let's, let's talk about kind of a, the most simple case of this. So we have n items that we put at random into n buckets. And for now, we just assume that these are placed uniformly and independently. So what is the probability for some k that there are k items that end up uh, in a particular bucket? So there we can use a union bound. So by the way, I should say that um, I'm going to kind of conclusions on the, on the slides, and I'm going to try to do some of the intermediate calculations on the board. Okay? So if you see something on the slide you don't immediately understand, it's probably because I didn't do the calculation yet. Right. So what's the probability that are k items that end up in one particular bucket? Well, there's a lot of k items sets, right? We have n choose k different item sets that each of which could potentially end up in bucket number 42, for example. But of course, each of them is quite unlikely. Right? If we had n buckets, the probability that they all end up in uh, bucket number 42 is n to the minus k. <coughs> so now this n kind of uh, not so easy to compute with, so we're going to make an upper bound, right? So n choose <coughs> k is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 down to n minus 1 divided by k factorial. Okay. So I'm just going to upper bound this product reasonably accurate approximation if k is small compared to n. So we have n to the k divided by k factorial times n to the minus k. So that's just 1 over k factorial, as, as stated up there. So if k is large enough, it's quite unlikely that any of these k's 
least one, one thing go wrong. Of course, this was just for one bucket, which was called bucket 42. So summing up over all n buckets, we get that the probability that we have some bucket with k uh, items in it is at most n over k factorial. So that's an factorial, not an exclamation mark. Right. Um, and then you might wonder, well, how long, how large does k have to be for this to be very, very small? And the answer turns out to be around log n divided by log log n. So you can kind of do the math with uh, Stirling's approximation to the factorial, for example. Um, so the largest part has size log n over log log n. Sometimes you have, of course, much fewer barcodes than items. Okay. So what's, what happens in the general case? There it turns out that we actually need a better bound on the binomial coefficient. Okay, so here we just use that n to k was at most n to the k divided by k factorial. Um, but there's a better bound you, you can get, which is on the slide, which is that you can upper bound n to k by e, so the base of the natural logarithm, times n over k to the k. Find this in extreme combinatorics by such and such Jupiter, for example. So again, we can do the union bound, but now we just need to. So let's, uh, let's try to do it. So we still have n choose k things that can go wrong, but now we have just r bins, not n. And we use the upper bound. number of balls in each bin. Right? And then we ask, how is the average related to k? Okay, so we take the average divided by k. Of course, it's not surprising that we get the average. But what is the probability that we get 10 times the average? Okay. So if we set k equal to 10 times n over r, you see that we get a number here which is smaller than one. In fact, it's smaller than one third to the power k. Okay. So once k is sufficiently larger than the average, we get something of exponentially small k. So in particular, suppose that k is 2e times the average, and it's also bigger than the logarithm of the number of buckets. So k is sufficiently big compared to the average and compared to the logarithm of the number of buckets, then the probability <coughs> that you have k things in one bucket is 1 over r. So this, in a nutshell, this means that if you have uh, n divided by log n buckets at most, you're going to get roughly log n in all of them with high probability. So this, that's a quite strong load balancing problem. So up to a constant factor, all buckets are going to have the same number of, of items. So all of this was using the assumption that we were ha hashing randomly and uh, independently. But actually, if you look at these, these proofs, all the probabilities I have in here is of the form r to the minus k, or n to the minus k. And that's because it's a probability about an event on k hash values. Okay. So, so the probabilities that I actually need to make this analysis just speaks about k hash values being in a certain way, colliding. Okay. So that's the observation. The consequence is that if we could come up with a hash function that looks or behaves fully random, if we just look at k 
has pair of the hash values, then actually all these things would go through. So this motivates the notion of k in the test. Okay. So a random hash function is k independent if whenever you look at k inputs, the outputs are independent. Usually it's understood all that they are uniform or very close to uniform or something. These two analyses I showed work if we have k independence. Okay. So, and in particular, I wanted k to be roughly logarithmic. So, we are interested in implementing k independence in general and, in particular, logging wise independence to get these kind of results. So, what's an easy implementation of one independence? Any idea? XKCD readers around. Okay, so this is one independent. Okay, so it's a, it's a constant hash function that is constantly equal to a randomly chosen number. Okay, so one independence is easy. Okay, so how do you get more than one independence? And the answer, I'm not going to put it back. So, or one answer. So what we do is that we take a, we look at the inputs as numbers in some field, and yeah, if if you like, you can think of it as a number modulo p or some prime p. Okay, so and then we take a random degree k minus one uh, hash function. That looks looks like this. So we simply choose random coefficients a0, a1 up to a k minus one, and our hash function just evaluates uh, this polynomial on the, on this on the input key. So first question: I claim that this is k independent. Take k different values in my in my field. So let's let's just suppose that they are in the prime field of such p. So modular arithmetic, modular p. I want to I want to argue that. Any combination of values here is equally likely. Or so, so for any choice of B1 up to BK, it's equally likely that I get these particular values. <coughs> there are two Think about how I chose this polynomial. It's I have these random coefficients. So the, the question really boils down to in how many ways can I choose coefficients of my polynomial such that if I evaluate it on x1, it's, it has the value b1. If I evaluate it on x2, it has the value b2, and, and so on. So this is basically polynomial interpolation, if you think about it, right? So if you remember, I don't know high school or something like this, you have certain input values and you have certain desired, desired values on these, uh, on these inputs and you can find a polynomial that goes through these points. So could it be that there are several different polynomials that go through the same step of, of values in these k inputs. So 
that would make this pa these particular values more likely, right? If there would be several ways of choosing the A's in order to, to get these particular K values. But I claim this is not the case. So suppose I have another choice, H prime, that also has these particular values, B1 in, when evaluated on X1. different output results if we think about these hash values here. So that's also P to the K. And I just argued that for each of these, there cannot be two that has the same. There cannot be two different polynomials that give the same output. So, so now because these have the same size, there has to be exactly one. So that was kind of one thing. So, so this kind of gives us the property we want. It gives random infinite values if we look at k inputs. But there's one kind of apparent problem, right? So usually when you are, you're, you're hashing, or at least in many applications, you actually want a reasonably small value. So here maybe we have a field that has size many billions. So, so what do you do? Well, you probably all seen the trick, so you just map down to the modular function or any kind of balanced way in which you can map big random values to smaller random values. So that can, when you do this, maybe you don't get completely uniform, complete uniformity, but it's going to be very close. So if you want to evaluate this, you should remember that there are smart ways of evaluating polynomials. So you shouldn't certainly shouldn't evaluate x to the i by multiplying x with itself i times. So you should use something like Horner's rule, or even better, this divide and conquer version of Horner's rule. So, so what does this do? So suppose we want to 
times a polynomial of one v one smaller minus the constant, and then you recurse on, on this. So that's Horn's rule. So that gives you a computation which is time k, assuming that the multiplication and addition is constant. So the divide and conquer version instead would look at the odd and even coefficients. Okay, so we have here the, the, the odd coefficients as x cubed as x. So we kind of pull those out. So far, this is, doesn't look too exciting. Um, but what, what we can see here is that actually here we are evaluating a polynomial in, with the input x squared. And also here we are evaluating a polynomial with, on the input x squared, and the degree of this polynomial is, is half. Okay? So this is a degree 1 polynomial evaluated on x squared. And this is a degree 1 polynomial evaluated on x So we can basically split the, pol the polynomial into two polynomials of half the degree, evaluate them in x squared, and then multiply one of them by x, and add them up. So I think it should be like this. Okay. So why is this better than Horner's Hon rules? Well, it's because it reduces data dependency. So if you look at modern computers, they really like if computations are independent. And Horner's rule is kind of very sequential. So you compute something and then you multiply it by x. So one thing has to go after the other. But if you look at this, well, these two things can happen in parallel, and in fact, uh, they will. If you if you implement this correctly, uh, these things are actually going to even even in a single thread, these uh, computations may or will be will will, will be parallelized, so you can get a, a good speed up by using this version of. So that was kind of one thing. I was assuming before that multiplication and addition was constant time. So how do you actually implement this? If you think about it, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a little bit tricky because maybe the keyword that we're working with is 64 bits. So we want to multiply two 64 bit numbers and we get a 128 bit number and we need to do a modular operation, for example, in case of uh, prime fields. But it turns out that if you uh, if you take advantage of uh, modern computers, CPUs, you can actually uh, do something much better than kind of the naive thing. And this is work by my student Tobias, who is somewhere here. Yes. Okay. So he looked into using a new operation, which is called careless multiplication. That actually allows you to do uh, fast multiplications in the field of size 2 to the 64. If you don't know what that field is, never, never mind. But carrier's multiplication actually almost gives you this. You also need to use some algebra called a sparsely reducible polynomial. Uh, so Piers implemented this, and he was able to get k independence in something like 3k nanoseconds. So if you want, I don't know, 20 independence, for example, take something like 60 nanoseconds, which is comparable to the time it takes to look up uh, a position in, in, in RAM. Okay? So it's, it's, it's not terrible. And you can actually even do a bit better if you consider the prime fields. So then you don't have, then your input has to be at most 61 bits. So that's the disadvantage. But you can use a uh, special kind of primes called Mersenne primes. So these are primes that look very, uh, very special. So if you 
is the kind of, this turns out to be a prime if, if we have 61, sorry, if we have 61 ones here, this turns out to be a prime number. And computing modulo uh, such a number is, uh, is quite simple because you, you basically just need some bit operations. So there you can use the rule I wrote up there that modulo p actually corresponds to a bit shift and an end operation. And if you don't believe me, you can take it as an, as an exercise to, to check this. And this actually gets the time for k independence down to about k nanoseconds. so much attention that even Danish TV wanted to know about these uh, great new headphones. So if you admit, we'll talk about this tomorrow. All right. So that was the construction of, of K independence. Any questions so far? All right. So, so yeah. What Sorry. happens to the independence when you reduce the range? So the independence remains. So random variables, even if you map them, will remain independent. So the only thing that happens is that, well, if we have, uh, if we, you know, a prime is not divisible, right? So we have something that is in a range that is prime size. So if you map it down, you cannot have the same number of things hitting each new value. So that it has to become a little bit uh, non uniform Let's look at two independents. So, so that would correspond to degree one polynomials, and now I just decided that I, the, one, the way I want to map down is by doing a module operation. So we take a degree one polynomial, uh, I mean the field of CP, and do a module R to get a value between <coughs> zero and R minus one. And there's a little, little optimization you can do here. So if you, if you think about it, <coughs> there's a really bad choice parameters A and B. Yeah. If you choose A equal to zero, the hash function is actually going to be a joke just like the XKCD coming. Right? It's just going to be constant. So you might as well be slightly more clever and choose uh, A different from, from zero. So then it's, um, so that reduces the collision probability a little bit. Um, It actually means that it compensates for the effect that we were just talking about. So even though uh, having things slightly non-uniform should increase the collision probability a little bit, the effect of choosing A different from zero compensates for this. So we actually get from the collision probability we want. If we think about two different inputs to the hash function, the probability that they have the same, produce the, the same value is at most one over Already this is, turns out to be surprisingly useful. And I'm going to, to show you one application of this, so you, I'm sure you'll see a lot, lot, lot more later on. So let's look at a set of, of elements. Suppose there are n of them. Um, and suppose we have some element that is not in the set. So they call that x. So the probability that the hash value of x is also a hash value of something in the set. So I write this as the h of a, x being in h of s. So this is a set of all the hash values when you hash all the elements of set of s. So the probability that h of x collides with something in s is at most n divided by r. So this is again just a unit bound. So we sum the probability, collision probabilities with every element S. And if we turn this around, we can say that the, or sorry, if we, if we sum over all um, elements of, of S, we can actually get that the probability that we don't have any collisions at all is pretty close to one whenever 
hash value of something in S that is not X itself. Well, we have n terms, and for each of them, the probability is at most um, n divided by r. So that's n squared over r. So that's the probability of having a collision, and so the probability of not having a collision, or an upper bound. So the probability of not having a collision is at least minus 1 minus this. So this means that basically, whenever we talk about hashing, we can assume that we actually have mapped down to a relatively small range. Suppose we are, we are the set of items that we're dealing with is UILs, so they come from a large universe of size. I don't know, two to the thousands or something like this, if a URL is a thousand bit. For example, but we can actually map it down to a rather small range, maybe two to the 128. Here we usually call this a signature. Okay, so when you hash something down to something that is unique with very high probability, <coughs> that you call a signature, and the probability that you get a collision is going to be extremely small. So, for example, if you you evaluate one billion hash values or compute one billion hash values per, per second, you need something like a century before you expect to see a collision if you use 128 bits. And if you're not happy with that, uh, go to two, 256 or something like this. So this is very useful for kind of fingerprinting information. If you want to have a short signature that allows you to identify so, and this is used in many, many places. Um, usually people don't use two independents, but they use cryptographic hash function for some reason. But that's, uh, I'll come back to that. <laughs> All right. But there are other ways to use signatures. Okay. So I'm going to give a little bit uh, uh, of a taste of actually what Michael is going to talk about later. Um, which is things that you can, something that you can do if you store a set of signatures. So the, on the last slide, I claim that if you have something that is not an S, the probability that its hash value is in is also hash value of an element in S is at most N over R. So suppose we choose R to be 2N, so this probability is at most one half, and then we store the set of hash values as a big map. So what does this give us? Well, one thing we can do, suppose this is the big map. If I come with a new element, I can compute its hash value, and the bit is here, and I can read off the bit, and the bit is zero. So then I know for sure my item is not in the set, because otherwise this bit would have been set. Okay. And if my item is not in the set, with probability 50% at least, uh, I hit one of these zeros. So we can basically use this data structure to determine if a key is in the set, but there's a false positive probability. So with probability 50%, even if it's not in the set, we hit one of the, the one positions in the, in the bitmap. Um, but of course we can repeat this, so we can store several of these bitmaps if we want to reduce this probability that we are misled. But the really nice thing is that we use almost no space yet. So we just use two bits per item. And Michael will even tell you how to reduce this further. Okay, so using very little space, we can get something that tells us approximately what are the things in a set. So what, what, what might we use this for? Well, Michael, I'm sure, is going to give a lot of uh, applications. So one of my favorite ones is suppose you want to go and read something like this. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Okay. So there's some key on the disk, maybe. You can go and look, at, look for it, of course. But that's going to take disk seeds and take a long time. Maybe if you, can, if you can just afford a few bits per item in the RAM, you can just go and check that to see if it's there or not. Okay? And most of the time, if it's not there, the 50% of the time or three quarters of the time, you're going to get the answer that it's not there, if it's not. Okay? And you can save a lot of uh, time on expensive operations like this. Now, so the next and last thing I'm going to talk about is something called linear probing. It's a very simple method of implementing a hash table. I'm 
no pointers, so just keys and some vacant space. Um, it's actually one of the first hash tables in Blender, but it's, it's actually is still hashed in Blender. So uh, how many of you saw linear probing before? Maybe half? Well, more, a bit more than half, okay. But in case you didn't, so let me just uh, tell you how it goes. So this is the hash table. We put uh, items into targets. Um, so, yes, I'm keeping kind of the shadow on, on top so you can keep track of the original hash values. So, at some point we have a collision, so what do we do? Well, the idea is that we just scan forward in the table until we find a preposition. Pre so, in this case, the, the eyes will be placed there. kind of see that you can have sometimes that something is stored quite far from the hash value. And when you look up, what you're going to do is to evaluate the hash function and go to the place, uh, to, the, to that place, and then scan forward until you either find the key or find an empty spot. So being stored far from your hash value is a problem. So how bad can this go? Maybe be before discussing that, I should just uh, tell you maybe why this is still relevant. I mean, it looks like a pretty bad idea, right? So things are going to pile up. Things will actually pile up. So once you have a lot of keys in one place, there's going to be even more keys because you're going to, because things are, are placed in this simple linear way. But I like to show this feature. Okay. So suppose there are two ways of achieving something. So you can either It'll take the shortest route, but the speed is golf cart, 20 kilometers per hour. Or you can do something that is, is longer, uh, but the speed is much, much larger, maybe race car on the highway. Okay. So that's actually pretty similar to the situation you have when you add address memory. So if you think about linear probing, it just goes down somewhere and scans the memory sequential, whereas other hashing methods will tend to jump around the memory. And the speed difference between these is something like an order of magnitude. Okay, so it's comparable to the golf cart versus uh, a racing car. So if you can do something that uses scans rather than random access, that's a, a big advantage. So I'll just add a, a small historical note Linear probing is actually one of the first non-trivial algorithms that were analyzed. So it was analyzed by Donald Knuth. He was a young, uh, young guy back in 1954. He was assuming that the hash function is fully random. Okay. And this is actually what he wrote up. Sorry, yeah. So the an analysis was in 62. It was described in 54. So it's actually, we have the 60th birthday of linear probing this year. Okay. And I'm not sure if you can read it, it's uh, the, the handwritten note on this says, my first analysis of an algorithm originally done during summer of 1962 in medicine. And there's a lot of people who have analyzed linear probing using this assumption. But the more recent thing is that now we actually have simple efficient hash functions that make it work, provably. And this is what I'm going to, to talk about. So Knuth's original analysis was very precise, very mathematically beautiful, but it relied on this full random assumption. So I'm going to give a modern proof which kind of ignores constant taxes, um, but is, is simpler and uses simple hash function. So what is the idea? So the idea is to say that somehow if linear probing takes a lot of time, then there is some interval that has a lot of hash value. Suppose these are the hash values. So we have the, the blue key here, that's the one key we care about, and the green and the red ones are those that are inserted before the blue one. And you can kind of see that if we only had the red ones, right, the blue one would go to location number two, right? So it would be very hard. If we only had the green ones, it would actually be the same. So the three green items would be placed in these three locations and the blue one would go there. So it's somehow a combination of items that land before and after that can make things take a long time. So in particular in this case, 
something like this or not. So I claim that it's not true like it. At least uh, the expected number of steps is going to be constant. So let's introduce a little bit of a notation. So Li, so I, for I being an interval, Li is the number of things that have hash values in this interval. So if you think about uh, the interval here of size 2, Li for that interval would be 3. So I claim that if you're using k probes to k steps to insert something, then there must exist an interval of at least size then k that contains h of x and has a lot of hash values. In particular, li is at least the length of the interval. And the proof is relatively simple. So each time you take a step forward, there's some set of items that you have passed. All of these items fall into some interval. And if you, if you look at how many things must be in that interval, well, this interval is completely full, because otherwise those items couldn't be there. So therefore, there must be at least the length of the interval keys with hash values in them. So the thing to remember is that the insertion time is at most the number of full intervals intervals where the number of hash values is equal to the length of the interval that surround the h of x. So this means that we just have to analyze how many of these full intervals are there. And you can kind of use uh, heavy machinery for this. I'm just going to mention it because probably it will be useful for you later in the week. So there's something called channel bounds. So just a quick uh, short poll. How many of you saw channel bounds? Okay, more than half. Okay, good. But basically, what channel bounds say in one kind of simple formulation uh, is that it's unlikely if, we, if, if you have a sum of independent events, so in this case, a sum of events that say does something land in interval i. Okay, so if we look at the in indicator variables for keys, whether they land in interval i or not, so li is just a sum of variables, um, then this sum is unlikely to be much larger than its expectation. So in particular, if we expect that an interval will be half full, so this is the case if we, if the load of the hash table is around 50%, um, then the channel bound says that the probability that we have, that the actual number that we observe is two times the expectation. So this is the same as the, as the interval being full, is exponentially small in the expe expectation. Okay? You can give more precise bounds than this, but, it's, but this is what you should remember some number less than one to the to a power which is the expectation. Okay? So short full intervals will appear, long, long full intervals will not appear. So something that's longer than logarithmic is not going to appear. And we can use this to compute the expected number of full intervals around <coughs> h of x. So let's sum over all possible interval lengths. So for intervals of length k, there are k of them. And each of them is full with this probability from the channel bound. And if you work this out, that turns out to be constant. So this was a little bit quick. Uh, but that's because I really want to go to, uh, to the case where we don't use channel bounds. Okay? But this is kind of the, the big hammer. It's, it gives a lot of nice results, but suppose we want to do it with smaller independence. So what can we do? And in particular, I'm going to talk about seven independence. So that's a degree six polynomial. Okay, so a little bit of, uh, of notation. So little l of i, that's the probability that a particular hash value ends up in the interval i. Um, yeah, and there's a typo here. So, okay, so that's the probability. that 
particular hash value is an i. And so it's uh, the length of the interval divided by r. And we were assuming that r, that's the length of the table, is at least two times the number of things end up in the interval compared to the expectation. Okay? So I'm going to count one if x ends up in the interval, but I'm going to subtract the expected uh, number of times it, it ends up, okay? which is Li. Okay? So this is a small trick to make this have expectation zero. And if we sum up all of these, we are going to get something that is essentially a line. So this is the bottom line here. So we are going to get a contribution of one for each thing that is in the interval. So that's a line. And then we are going to get a contribution of minus little a line for each, which is just the expectation. So what this sum says is how much do we differ from the expectation. So we expect the interval to be half full. To be full, it should differ by, from the expectation by its length divided by two. So now comes the most technically heavy side. So uh, if, you are, if you are feeling sleepy, maybe it will be half to follow, but um, here goes. So in order to estimate the probability that this sum is more than half of the interval length, so that's the same as saying that the interval is full, we make the following trick. We simply take each side of this inequality and take it to the power 6. Okay. So this sound looks a little bit magical, but it's actually a standard trick in uh, probability theory for the central model. But these are just equivalent conditions, so the probability is the same. And now we can estimate this probability using Markov's inequality. Okay, so the probability that something has a certain size is at most uh, the expectation divided by that size. Okay, so Markov's inequality says that if, if we expect something to have uh, the value 10, for example, the probability that it, the value is really 100 can be at most 10%. Because the otherwise, the, the expectation would have been larger. So it's one of the simplest inequalities in probability theory. So now what we, what we, we, all we need to do to estimate this is to compute this expectation here, which looks kind of awkward. But let me, let me try to write it up here. linearity of expectation, we can kind of take each sum out or each, each term out here. So let's, for example, do yx1 times yx2 <coughs> times yx3. Okay. Suppose we have a term here where there are six different <coughs> Six different items. How big is this uh, expectation going to be? Well, if these are different items, then these variables. 
that are independent. Okay, so this is where I use independence. So the definition of yx was depending on h of x. So if we have different yx's, they're going to be independent as long as we have at most six of them. So this thing So that's how it was chosen. It was that's why I was subtracting this value li. That was exactly to make the expectation zero. So this kind of term just goes out. It doesn't contribute to the expectation. And in fact, as as long as there's something here that is, doesn't appear more than once, the expectation is going to be zero because you can kind of uh, split the expectation into a product and with one of the, uh, yeah, with, <coughs> and where you multiply zero with, with something else. So it turns out that the only things that actually contribute are those where, where we have at least, uh, at most, three, I, three different items in here, each of which appears at least twice. Okay. So it's a little bit messy to figure out exactly how many those are. But it turns out that it's actually, it's all the impute. It's kind of uh, intuitive. You know, how many, how many ways can you choose the different items that's impute? And then for each of them, we have a <coughs> bunch of different terms, different orders, different multiplicities. And you can, so one of the bounds that I worked out last night is 512 on, on, on this. Okay, so that's certainly, certainly not time. So this, this actually turns out, so now we have something that's polynomially small. So before we had something that was exponentially small. So the probability that we have a lot of things in an interval was exponentially small in the length of the interval. So now we have something that is just polynomially small. Some constant over interval length to the third. So that turns out to be enough. So we can still do the kind of the same kind of computation. Do it computation of the expected number of intervals that is uh, that are full um, and just insert this probability 512 over interval length cubed and we get this kind of sum here one over k squared and maybe you know that this is something that converges so all of this is actually a constant so what goes wrong if you choose five or four instead of six? So that's that's a, that's a great uh, question. So if, if we go down to six independence, so by the way, I was saying seven, but once once we fix one of the hash values, the rest is only six independent. Okay, so once we condition on h of x having a particular value, everything else is six independent. If we could go down to five, so then everything will be four independent, four independent and uh, things actually turn out to work out, but not by this argument. You need a more refined argument. If you do go even further down, uh, Mikkel with Mihai Petrasko has shown that it no longer works. So the tail bounds are not sharp enough and you can actually give counterexamples. So you can give cases where uh, I think I actually take logarithmic time. Yeah, so what, what goes wrong with, with the argument you just showed? Okay, so in this argument, if we had less independence, we would have 1 over k, sum of 1 over k, which is not convergent. So it's it's going to give us log n bounds. So that was the number of full intervals, the insertion times the most number of full intervals. And as I just said, uh, 
file analysis shows that five independence actually works. So you have to do a union bound over less things. Uh, and then it turns out that five is actually the right answer in terms of independence. So if you just have four independence, there are some cases where it doesn't work. Yep. There may still yeah. be there may still be the hash functions that are only three independent that work. It's just that not all three or four independent hash functions. Work. Yes. Okay. So this is this is an important uh, thing to notice. So these are sufficient conditions, but not necessary conditions. Thank you. Right. So there are simple hash functions, and you will see some of them uh, later on uh, by Mikkel that also work, uh, but are not five independent. Okay. So when I say four independent does not, uh, it should really read four independent not does not always. So here are a few references if you want to read more. I just want to end with kind of a, an epilogue on, on, on this because we have these nice results about how to uh, construct hash functions that make things probably work. But actually, in reality, what people do is use deterministic caching. So in Java, for example, it is still the hash function that is used, or at least in some versions of Java. Okay, so it's completely deterministic. You have a hash a string by kind of modifying its character with a fixed number, 31, and doing things uh, completely deterministically, and it's very easy to find things that collide. And you can actually find, you can take these uh, collisions and com combine them, so to speak, in different ways, and quickly get a lots, of, a lots and lots of things that have the same hash value. So this is not really uh, satisfactory, you might think. Um, there's a lot of better heuristic functions. So, so this is among the worst ones. Um, you may have heard about Murma hash or city hash or zip hash. And these are, these are certainly better. Uh, but they're still not randomized. Um, but I think they, some, some people are actually starting to, to care, not because they care about analysis of algorithms, but because they care about something called denial of service attack. Okay. So can someone in put a load on your hash table, for example, that causes it to be very slow. Then you can maybe take the server and make it do no useful work at all. Okay. And there was a <coughs> seminal paper from 2003, and actually follow-up papers that actually tried, took some newer hash functions and kind of uh, showed that they were not uh, really suitable for or robust against these kinds of attacks. So if you look at libraries, they basically still use deterministic caching, like Java or C++ or C Sharp. Uh, Java has kind of a, a, a patch. If you, if you like, if hashing goes really badly, it, it falls back to some kind of search screen. Right? But that, that doesn't seem like the right solution. But um, some of the small languages are actually picking up this. So if you go to Ruby or Python newer versions, they use random hashing. And even Perl, if deterministic hashing is bad, then it switches over to, to, to randomized hashing. So I think many of these things that I've talked about are going to actually make it out in the real world in the coming years. All right, well, that was slightly more than 50 minutes, but uh, nevertheless, now it's time for.